The 18th game of 1951 World Championship match was so unusual that Grandmaster Fine called it the most fantastic of all games played in matches for the World Championship, from La Bourdonne to Mikhail Tal. In the game, the challenger David Branstein intuitively sacrificed a piece, getting three far advanced connected passed pawns. However, he made a mistake in a winning position, and the world champion Mikhail Batvinik found a paradoxical move that miraculously saved a seemingly hopeless position. Branstein started with d4, and Batvinik played the Slav defense c4, c6, knight c3, knight f6, knight f3, e6, e3. This position already occurred in the match. In the eighth game, Batvinik played the Miran system knight d7, bishop d3, d takes c, bishop takes c4, b5 with a sharp game. In this game, however, Batvinik decided to avoid the Meran system as he expected that Branstein most probably would find the improvement. That's why he played a6. And after bishop d3, again he avoided the natural move d takes c and played b5 instead, immediately attacking the pawn on c4. If white plays c5, which at first sight uh, seems strong, grabbing space on the queen side, that would be premature, because black would simply play knight d7 and liberating e5 next move, threatening also e4 with a fork, and c5 would also be weak after that. That's why, after b5, uh, Branstein, instead of c5, played simply b3, defending the pawn on c4. Knight d7, castle kingside, bishop b7, and now that the bishop moved from c8, and the pawn on e6 is unguarded by the bishop, now it's the right time to play c5, what Branstein did. And it turns out that now e5 isn't so effective. But Vinnie gives the following variation. If e5, then d takes e, knight g4, attacking the pawn on e5 twice. However, white would simply play e6, and after f takes e, knight d4, attacking the knight and the pawn. And after knight takes c5, queen takes g4, knight takes d3, queen takes e6, check, as the bishop isn't guarding e6 anymore. And after queen e7, queen f5, white would be better. So, as e5 doesn't work, now Branstein plays c5. And bishop e7, but Winnick just continues the development. a3, a5. The idea is to prevent white from playing e4. If white plays e4 now, black would simply play b4. Pushing away the knight, which controls e4 square, and after the knight moves, black would simply capture on e4 with a fork. Bishop b2, castle kingside, queen c2, g6. But Vinnik is going to move his rook to e8. Then Fianchetto, his bishop, taking under full control e5 square, after which the pawn from e6 would move to e5, with a great position for black. b4. Branstein is going to open up the position on the queen side by capturing on a5 and playing a4. In order to prevent this, Batvinik captures on b4, and now only the a file is open on the queen side. Queen c7, and as the rook is only seemingly actively placed on uh, a1, on a file, the rook doesn't have any squares of invasion on this file, Branstein moves it to e1 to the center, preparing the active play in the center. Rook e8, and here Branstein makes a, an inaccurate move. He plays knight e2, however, both Branstein and Batvinik in their annotations agree that knight e5 would be much more energetic, followed by f4, reinforcing the knight's centralized position on e5. And of course, black wouldn't be able in this case to capture twice on e5 because of simple tactics. Knight e4 with discovered attack on the queen, and also attacking twice the knight on f6, and after the queen retreats, uh, white would simply capture on f6. But, instead of more active knight e5, Branstein played knight e2. But Vinnik continues his uh, plan, bishop f8, he is going to fianchetto to the bishop, and it turns out that now knight e5 doesn't work, because black would simply capture, and after d takes e, play knight g4, attacking e5 two times, and it turns out that as the knight moved from c3 to e2, it is blocking the rook, and white cannot play f4 in order to defend the pawn on e5, because e3 would fall, as it's unguarded now, the knight is blocking the rook. That's why, after bishop f8, Branstein plays h3 first, in order to take under control g4 square, preventing the knight 
from jumping on g4. Bishop g7, and now knight e5. Of course, black cannot capture on e5. That would be positionally positional mistake because after d takes e, the knight cannot jump on g4 anymore, and after the knight retreats, white would simply play f4, defending the pawn and getting a great blockading square for the knight on d4, and the knight would be greatly placed on d4, and white would have a positional advantage. That's why, of course, Batwinik didn't capture on e5 and played knight f8. f3. So before moving this pawn on f4, Brandstein plays f3 in order to keep both opportunities, uh, either e4 or f4. So he would choose later in the game. But after Batwinik's reply, knight d7, attacking the knight three times, Brandstein was forced to play f4 in order to defend the knight. f6, Batwinik is pushing away the knight from the active position, knight f3. And now Batvinik made a kind of waiting move, rook e7, because he couldn't have played actively. e5 would be in white's favor, as it would lead to the opening of the center after e4, and the opening of the center would be in white's favor, as white pieces are much better prepared to the open fight. White pieces are much more active, especially uh, black's light squared bishop is very bad. It wouldn't participate in this uh, battle, and uh, the opening of the center would be catastrophic for black. That's why Batvinik makes a waiting move. Rook e7. Knight c3, and now Batvinik locks the center, f5, preventing white from active play in the center once and for all. Now, Batvinik writes in his annotations that he expected Brandstein to play on the king side, and the most natural looking plan for white would be g4. However, Brandstein chose absolutely different plan. He decided to play on the queen side instead. So he returns his rook on the open a file. Rook a1, rook e8, knight e5, centralizing the knight. The rooks are exchanged. The second rook moves to a file and a very sophisticated move by Brandstein. Queen b1, defending the rook with a queen. And now the bishop is free. The bishop uh, doesn't need to defend the rook anymore, and it's free to move away from b2. And you will see in a couple of moves how important this is. And here Batvinik made a mistake. Instead of queen b8, he played queen c8. And you will see why this move is a mistake after Brandstein's next brilliant move. He sacrifices the material and gets a positional advantage. You can pause the video and find a brilliant move. So he sacrifices his bishop on b5. Bishop takes b5. Both Brandstein and Batvinik in their annotations gives this move a double exclamation mark. The idea is to get two connected passed pawns for the piece. Before accepting the sacrifice, Batvinik improves his pieces. First he captures on e5. After f takes e, he improves his bishop, bishop h6, attacking the pawn on e3, threatening to capture it with check. And now you can see the idea behind queen b1. Now that the queen protects the rook, the bishop can move away. So bishop c1, defending the pawn on e3. And now Batvinik is forced to accept the sacrifice. C takes b, knight takes b5. So white got two connected passed pawns, and also the knight would be greatly placed on d6. It would dominate. And now you can see why queen c8 was worse than queen b8. The knight would jump on d6 with tempo, attacking the queen. Besides that, the queen on b8 would be better placed because it would control important squares on the b file as white pawn on b4 is going to advance on the b file. So the queen would be placed much better on b8 than on c8. Besides that, the knight on d6 would be intolerable for black and black would be forced to exchange it by playing bishop f8 and capturing on d6 after which white would capture with e pawn and the pawn from e5 would move to d6, and white would have three connected passed pawns after this. And that proves Brandstein's sacrifice absolutely positionally justified. 
Knight d7. Knight d6 attacking the queen. The rooks are exchanged. Queen a8. And Brandstein, of course, avoids the exchange of queens. However, he makes, he places his, moves his queen on a wrong square. Instead of queen b2, defending the pawn on b2 and supporting its advance, he plays queen c3. And you will see in a couple of moves the difference. Bishop f8, but Vinik is going to exchange this great knight. b5. The knight is exchanged, and queen a4, but Vinik activated his queen and attacks the pawn on b5, and it turns out that the queen would be much better placed on b2. If the queen was on b2, the pawn would be already protected, but now Brandstein had, uh, has to spend an additional tempo to defend this pawn, queen b2. Instead of queen b2, c6 would be bad, because black would simply capture the pawn, and white of, re returns the sacrificed piece. However, after queen takes d7, in the opposite colored bishop's endgame, the position would be more or less equal. That's why, instead of uh, moving the pawn on c6, Brandstein defends the pawn on b5, and he will be able to move the pawn when the right time comes. King f7. Here, Brandstein makes another inaccurate move. He plays king h2. This is a kind of prophylactic move, moving the king from the first rank, so that black doesn't uh, play queen d1 with check. However, both Brandstein and Batvinik agree that bishop d2 would be much stronger, followed by queen b4. And the exchange of queens, of course, would be in white's favor, as at the moment, if white plays c6, Black captures with a bishop, and after white pawn captures, the queen can capture on c6. But after the exchange of queens, white would play c6, and after bishop captures on c6, b takes c, white would have two connected passed pawns on c6 and d6, with tempo attacking the knight, and the pawns would promote. So, that means after queen b4, black would need to retreat the queen from the active position, and white would even increase the advantage. However, instead of bishop d2, followed by queen b4, Brandstein played king h2. He's still better. Now, Batvinik was again in the time tri trouble, and he made a mistake, a typical time trouble move, h6. He didn't want to risk, he didn't want to move his pieces, as it was risky to place a piece on a wrong square, that's why he just moved a pawn. However, this move proves to be a mistake. Instead of h6, Batvinik in his annotations suggests much stronger move, knight f6. The knight is moving to the active square on e4, and also vacating d7 square for the king, and the king is going to move to d7, and take part in the blockade of these terrible connected passed pawns. For example, bishop d2, king e8, and if queen b4, then simple, now black can exchange the queens, as the king has joined the blockade, king d7, and if white plays c6, of course, black would capture twice on c6. Or, instead of queen b4 in this position, if white plays c6 immediately, then again, bishop takes c6, b takes c, queen takes c6, queen b8 check, king d7, queen a7 check, king c8, queen e7, knight e4 attacking the bishop, and after queen takes e6, queen d7, and the position would be more or less equal. But, instead of knight f6, Batvinik, who was in a time trouble, played h6. Now, Brandstein made a sharp move, e4. As usual, he tries to complicate the game. By playing e4, he opens the bishop's diagonal, attacked h6, and also the pawn is threatening to advance for further on e5, supporting, reinforcing even more the pawn on d6, and also taking under control f6 square, restricting, re restricting uh, black pieces even more. However, instead of e4, probably, objectively, better would be bishop d2, still, followed by queen b4, which Batvinik suggests in his annotations. After e4, however, Batvinik played f4. 
In his annotations, he writes that capturing on e4 would be a mistake. If f takes e, then simple bishop takes h6 and uh, white is invading into black's rear. Queen f2 would follow, check, queen h4, then the queen penetrates on e7 and that would be catastrophic for black. Or instead of uh, f takes e if uh, black captures with a d-pawn, then d5, again opening the queen's diagonal, and again white invades after bishop takes h6, for example, queen would move to uh, g7, and again that would be catastrophic for black. That's why Batvinik played f4, but now e5, the pawn is very strong now, reinforcing the pawn on d6 and taking under control f6, uh, squares, squeezing black even more. g5, defending the pawn on f4. Queen e2, king g7, and in this position the game was adjourned as they reached move 40. And Branstein had to seal a move, and he sealed a wrong move. He could have won on the spot. If he sealed the right move, which is c6, as Batvinik shows in his annotations, he would have won on the spot. After bishop takes c6, b takes c, queen takes c6, he had the bishop sacrifice, bishop takes f4. And after g takes f, queen g4 check, king f7, queen takes f4 check, king g7, queen g4 check, king f7, queen h4 attacking both h6 and threatening a devastating queen e7 check, followed by the capture on e6, after which black's position would collapse. And if knight f8, defending e6, then simple capture on h6, and the h-pawn would move further, and it would advance, and there is nothing black can do to prevent the advance of this pawn, as white also has another passed pawn on d6, and white would be winning on the spot. Instead of this simple, obvious c6 move, however, Branstein sealed the move queen d3, after which the victory slips away from him. He explains uh, this move in his annotations. He writes that he thought that black cannot improve his pieces anyways, and white would have the chance to play c6 later in the game. There is nothing black can do to prevent it. And, bef and he didn't want to commit to make a forcing move before the adjournment of the game. And also, he wanted to improve the position of his king first. He wanted to play h4, exchange on g5, after that move his king forward to h3, to g4, attacking g5 square, uh, pawn, create threats on the king side, and then, when the right time comes, also advance on the queen side. However, Batvinik, in his uh, home analysis, just 90 minutes before the resumption of the game, found a great paradoxical move that saves the game. And he proves Bram Branstein wrong. He actually can improve the position of his pieces. You can pause the video and try to find Batvinik's brilliant move which, again, both Branstein and Batvinik give double exclamation mark in their annotations. So, Batvinik moves his knight to the, retreats the knight to the initial position, knight b8, taking under full control c6 square. And now, when white plays c6, black would capture on c6 with a knight, not with a bishop. And after uh, b takes c, either the queen or the bishop captures on c6, and we will get the opposite color bishop endgame. Either with queens or without queens, this endgame would be drawish. h4. Branstein is trying to weaken black's king side. However, as Batvinik writes in his annotations, by playing h4, white also weakens his own king side. And this will be very important, as you will see. Black would skillfully exploit this weak weakening of the white's king side. Queen c4. Now that c6 square under black's full control, Batvinik isn't scared of the exchange of queens anymore. 
because if the queens are exchanged and white plays c6, black would capture with a knight after b takes c. The bishop would capture on c6, and bishop also from c6 from c6 would control d7 square, and the pawn wouldn't be able to advance. And the opposite colored bishop endgame, of course, would be drawish. That's why Branstein avoids the exchange of queens and plays queen h3, attacking e6 and leaving his bishop unguarded. However, it turns out that bishop takes c1 would be a mistake, and instead, Batvinik captures the pawn on b5, which is much more dangerous than the bishop on c1. In his annotations, Batvinik um, explains why queen takes c1 would be a mistake. White would simply capture on g5, then on e6, and after queen e3, threatening queen g3 check, uh, followed by queen e1 check uh, with perpetual check, white would simply check on f6, then capture on g5, and after queen g3 check and exchange of queens, White would have four connected passed pawns, and black pieces would be unable to stop them. Besides that, white has one more one more passed pawn on g2. That's why instead of capturing the bishop, Batvinik captures the pawn on b5. H takes g. H takes g. Queen takes e6. Now again a strong move by Batvinik. Queen d3, threatening to check on g3, and that would lead to perpetual check after queen e1 check and queen g3 check. Queen f6 check, king h7. Now, if queen takes uh, g5, then again queen g3 check, and after exchange of the queens, black now has the defense. Bishop c8, and all squares in front of the pawns are under black's control. The knight is controlling c6, d7 and e6 are controlled by the bishop, the king would stand on g6, after which white king won't be able to uh, penetrate the king side, and the only dark squared bishop won't be able to do anything. The dark squared bishop won't be able to control light squares on c6, on d7 or on e6, and that means that black would build a fortress in this case. That's why... In this position, after king uh, h7, Branstein uh, didn't capture on g5 and played queen f7 check. However, after king uh, h8, queen f6 check, king h7, Branstein now sacrifices on f4. He isn't uh, risking anything because he has the perpetual check. After g takes f, he gives a lot of checks. And finally... After all these checks, he captures the bishop. But now, Batvinik has perpetual. Queen g3 check, and after king h1, the, king, the queen just moves back and forth to e1 and g3. That's why they agreed to a draw. Hit the like button as it's really helpful for the channel growth, and see you in the analysis of game 19.